Um, how many of you are communications majors, journalism students, or anything like that? Raise your hands, please. All right, good. Um, <laughs> I wish we had more, but it's good means glad to have you here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend Matthew Kalman. He is a British freelance journalist who lives in Jerusalem and has lived there since 1998. There's probably a statute of limitations on still being able to call yourself a foreign correspondent. No. There isn't? No. So... I'm, I'm, there's people who've been there a lot longer than me. Still and they're... So he does have British passport because I just checked it a few minutes ago to make sure. And he is a foreign correspondent. He has done work for Time Magazine, USA Today, Newsweek, the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, Daily Mail. And he wrote an article on the BYU Jerusalem Center for the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is a major trade publication about higher education, uh, primarily in the United States. You can Google him and find lots of interesting things, including uh, links to YouTube where he talks on a variety of subjects. Uh, some personal items, many of his extended family perished in the Holocaust. His parents had come to England um, in their childhood before the Nazis came to power in Europe. Mr. Kalman graduated from Cambridge University. As I mentioned, he went to Israel in 1998. He is, one of his reporting specialties is archaeology, uh, and he has uh, done some wonderful work talking about archaeology, not just as the discipline of archaeology, but how archaeology impacts politics in uh, the state of Israel. Archaeology is a major political event in Israel. Did I say that accurately? Does anybody here know anything about archaeology in Utah? Not much tie to politics, but every little potsherd found in the ground has some political connection. He recently published books on the death of Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat and also on the political career of Prime Minister Benjamin uh, Netanyahu. And he and his wife Judy are the parents of four children. A few years, a couple of years ago at the Jerusalem Center, when I introduced Mr. Kalman as a speaker there, uh, he offended one of the students um, who was a journalism major uh, because Mr. Kalman doesn't always say nice things about how Western journalists do journalism in the Holy Land. Did I say that gently enough? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> But I think you will find him engaging and interesting. So I'm pleased to invite him to come and speak to us today. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Kent. Thank you, Eric, for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here today because um, uh, many of you, um, many of you haven't seen me before, but um, I see a lot of familiar faces here today, um, and uh, you'll probably know that I've been uh, coming to speak to students at the um, BYU Jerusalem Center for the last, I think, five years now. Um, each of the groups that comes through, uh, and so it's it's a real pleasure for me to finally be able to to, to come back and see you see you on your on your home turf. That's uh, that's really nice. Um, and uh, I spent the last two days getting acquainted with, uh, with Salt Lake City, and I visited the Tabernacle and the Convention Center and Temple Square, and I've seen the statues. And the, um, It's a nice place you have here. It's really nice. And we even went up to um, Park City to look, at the, to look at the powder, but I didn't get on the snowboard because I didn't have enough time. So next time, next time you're taking me skiing, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you. Somebody's got to take me skiing. Um, the Middle East is a kind of complicated place, as you may have noticed, any of you who've studied or read uh, your newspapers or looked online. And um, it became particularly complicated um, at the end of 2010 when something called the Arab Spring began. 
And that, uh, that, that was a series, a cascade of events that has completely uh, redrafted the map of the Middle East. It's completely altered the strategic uh, military conditions of the Middle East. Uh, and um, I was with the head of Israel's military intelligence a couple of weeks ago, and he had a map on his desk, which was covered in stains. Um, and I thought he'd spilt his coffee on it. And um, he explained to me that wasn't coffee stains. Uh, each stain represented the number of fundamentalist Islamist fighters who've infiltrated into the Middle East in the last four years. Um, and two years ago, uh, the head of Israel's military intelligence, this guy called Brigadier General Aviv Kochavi, uh, wrote to his counterparts in military intelligence all over the Western world. And uh, he warned them that with the beginning of the Arab Spring and the beginnings of the revolutions in Egypt, in Syria, and in other places, there was a danger that within a couple of years, there might be as many as 20,000 Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-affiliated or Al-Qaeda-type uh, militants infiltrating into the Middle East, which would be a major force for the destabilization uh, of, of the Middle East and, and a, major, a major geopolitical threat. And when I saw him two weeks ago, um, he told me he'd been, he'd been wrong in that letter. He was absolutely wrong. Uh, there weren't 20,000 uh, uh, Islamic militants who'd infiltrated into the Middle East. There are 30,000 Islamic mil militants who've infiltrated into the Middle East. And that means that the Israeli military, for just as one example, has had to completely redraw their strategic military plans. Everything has changed in the Middle East in the last four years. Um, but if you go back to the newspapers, uh, and when I say newspapers, I mean media and social media and video and web and everything else, go back to the media in 2010, and you'll find millions of words just in English about what was going on in the Middle East in 2010, and you'll find thousands of words of analysts and commentators and people predicting and, and explaining and telling you what was going to happen in the Middle East in the next years. And go back to 2010 and see how many of those words actually predicted what was going to happen in the Middle East. How many people predicted the Arab Spring among all the commentators and all the analysts and, and all the explainers. And um, the answer is zero. None of them predicted what was going to happen in the Middle East. Nobody saw it coming. No one saw it coming at all. And then when it started happening, if you remember, it began in Tunisia, and then it spread to Egypt and to Libya and to Syria and to other places. When it started happening, then th having failed to predict that it was going to happen, these same people, instead of saying, you know what, I don't know anything about the Middle East. I'm going to stop trying to predict things. I, you know, I admit it, right? That didn't stop them, having got it wrong the first time. Um, they then said, okay, now this business has started. You know, we've never been to Tunisia, but we'll now start commentating and analyzing and explaining it to you. Um, and now we're going to tell you what's going to happen next. And among all the things that they predicted, there were two things that they said was going to happen next. They said, first of all, that the next... Arab regime to fall because it was poised between uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamists and democratic and other forces was going to be Jordan, that King Abdullah of Jordan was going to be the next domino to fall in the Arab Spring. And the other thing that they firmly predicted back in 2011 was uh, that the Arab Spring would have a fundamental effect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because it would have a fundamental effect on internal Palestinian politics. And as a result, we were going to see major upheavals, major changes, and major moves in the Palestinian arena as a result. They failed to predict Egypt. They failed to predict Syria. They failed to predict the spillover into Lebanon. They failed to predict the Yemen. Uh, but those were the predictions that they made. And as you will know if you read anything about the Middle East in the last four years, uh, nothing happened in Jordan, and nothing happened in the Palestinian arena either. Uh, so they got it completely 100% wrong. Has that stopped them continuing to analyze and commentate and explain? No, they're still doing it. They're still doing it. But next time you read one of those commentators, 
Just bear in mind that everything that they've told you up till now has been wrong, okay? And so, so just be careful when accepting anything they're telling you about what's gonna happen next. There is a, a Talmudic saying that uh, with the destruction of the second temple, the power of prophecy was taken away from wise men and given to children and idiots. Um, I think that reporters should try reporting instead of trying to be prophets. I think they might do a much better job. And whenever anybody asks me, and I'm sure that some of you will, what, what do you think is gonna happen? What do you think is gonna happen with the peace process? What do you think is gonna happen with Syria? What do you think is gonna happen in Israeli politics? I gotta tell you, as a reporter, I have enough trouble accurately telling you what happened yesterday. And if I do my job correctly and I'm able to do that right, then I'm happy. Don't ask me what's gonna happen tomorrow. I know some of you still will, but I'm just, that's my health warning, okay? I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do that. And if I do do that, then just file me under the children and idiots, okay, if I, if I try to do that. Why, why does that happen? Why is the reporting from the Middle East and of the Middle East, why is it so bad? Why is it so inaccurate? Why, why do, do, do we, me and my esteemed colleagues, why do we keep making these terrible mistakes? Um, it's, it's due to several things that I'm gonna explore with you in the, in the few minutes that we have available to us this morning. Um, but it's something that uh, starts with a phenomenon that I've come to call parachute journalism. What I mean by parachute journalism, there is a, an attraction of Israel and Palestine to foreign correspondents. It's attractive because um, we like to look like heroes. We like to look like important people. One of the problems with being a reporter is that you are faced every day with um, the reality that you are basically a parasite, uh, that all you ever do, essentially, is to report and describe the uh, very interesting and very and sometimes very important uh, activities of others. And um, at a certain stage, you realize that what does that say about you? Are you creating anything? Are you constructing anything? Are you in any way contributing to the well-being of society? Uh, my wife is a teacher. She teaches children at risk. She rescues them from the dustbin of society and she gets them back on track so that they can find jobs and, 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 and live uh, worthwhile lives. She's contributing something to society. My oldest daughter is a paramedic and if you I hope you don't, but if you ever find yourself in Haifa with a broken leg or something worse and you turn up at Rambam Hospital in Haifa, then my daughter is one of the people who might help you know, save your life or mend your leg or whatever it is. She is contributing something useful to society. Me? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Uh, but many of my colleagues have problems coming to terms with that. So what they do is they dress up their work in ways that make them seem much more important than we actually are. And one of the ways that we do that is by going to war zones. Because, well, if you're in a war zone, then you must be very brave and you must be very heroic. And it's true, some of the reporters who do go to war zones are very brave and very heroic. One of my colleagues, uh, Marie Colvin from the Sunday Times, was extremely brave and heroic, and we used to work together, and she was killed in Syria. Uh, about 18 months ago by uh, a Syrian government rocket. And people, there are very brave, very heroic journalists who do go into these war zones and they get hurt and killed and I have the greatest respect for them. What I don't have the greatest respect for are people who come to somewhere like Israel and Palestine where actually there is no war going on and they pretend there is. And it's very easy to do because you see, Israel is a very small place so what you can do is you can wake up in the morning in the five-star luxury of the American Colony Hotel in East Jerusalem. Within two hours, you can be down a smuggling tunnel in the company of a really evil-looking Hamas terrorist in Gaza, and you can be back at the American Colony in time for their very good buffet dinner after having filed your story on the same day. It's the five-star war. And that's why we get so many journalists coming, 
because they know that they can come there and they can appear heroic war correspondents, but they don't actually have to walk the walk. And if you don't believe me, um, I'll give you just one very small example. About 18 months ago, uh, the uh, Palestinians applied for membership of the UN, if you remember. They actually applied twice. Uh, the first time was 18 months ago. And uh, so for uh, an entire week, one of the British television networks uh, sent out a, a whole crew, and they broadcast the, the evening news program live from the West Bank to celebrate this, uh, this phenomenon of, of perhaps Palestine finally gaining recognition as an independent state. And it was a week of parties. It was Ramallah. Ramallah was like Temple Square at Christmas time. Okay, uh, there were lights and music and 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 dancing, and the kids were let out of school. It was a festival, and everyone was having a very very good time because there was this there was this real sense of this uh, 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 that, that something historic was was about to happen, and it, it was great. I have to tell you, it was a great party, and so I was with the correspondent, and we were we were go going around the country and doing these different reports, and I I I went online one day to just to look at the story that he had filed based on the reporting that we'd done. And suddenly, he was standing there in front of an Israeli army jeep wearing a flak jacket and a helmet. Uh, now, this, uh, there's a little bit in television. Um, if any of you, there was a few media students hiding at the back, right? Hi. Um, so you may have learned that when you do television, you do a television story, you shoot a lot of what's called B-roll, which is all the pictures of sort of people doing things so you can talk over it, and you do some interviews, and then you do something called a stand-up or a piece to camera, which is where I stand uh, in, in front of the camera with an uh, interesting background behind me, and, and the idea is that places me in the context of my report. So I'll stand there in a flak jacket and a helmet in front of a tank, trying to look like a war hero, and I'll say, uh, Hi, hello, this is, uh, yes, this is Matthew Kalman. I'm standing here in a flak jacket and a helmet in front of a tank, looking like a war hero, and, uh, uh, well, you can forget the rest because that's the important bit, right? So, um, so that, that's what we do. And, um, and that's what this guy did. And, but the thing is, there weren't any, there, weren't, there was no fighting. There was no war. There was, it was a celebration. There was a party going on. And I said to him, where, where on earth did you shoot that? You, we, we, I was with you all week. And we never came across anywhere where you have to wear a flak jacket. And he said, well, I heard there were some kids throwing stones at an army checkpoint five miles away. So I drove over there to do the stand up from there. Right? I didn't ask him why, because I knew the reason why. The reason why was because it looks good. It looks good. And also having hired the flak jacket and schlepped it all the way from Britain to, to Ramallah, right? You can't like to go home and not using it. You know, you look like a jerk. So, it, you know, it's, it's much better to use it and say, yes, I was in a war zone. So th there's a real problem with people parachuting in like that uh, to try and portray the place, even when there's only a party going on, that it's still a war zone. That's parachute journalism, and it leads to the most terrible mistakes. Terrible mistakes. Um, so, for example, uh, look at all the stories about Bethlehem at Christmas over the last 10 years. Now, I've, this is a, you know, a modern media tradition. We have to write a story about Bethlehem at Christmas because it's Christmas time. No one else is doing anything. There's no news anywhere else in the world. So. Bethlehem at Christmas, that's the obvious thing to do. So for the, for the last 10 years, people have been writing stories about the terrible economic conditions of Bethlehem at Christmas. And that's because uh, with the start of the Second Intifada in the year 2000, and the suicide bombings and the Israeli invasion, the building of the security wall and all the trouble that was going on there, uh, yes, the unemployment in Bethlehem rose and the tourists stopped coming. And for about five or six years, Bethlehem underwent a very serious economic decline because it basically lives off the tourism of pilgrims. So every year for you know, several years, uh, you had stories about Bethlehem at Christmas and the terrible economic situation. The problem now is that if you, don't, if you haven't been there for a long time, and this is the advantage of having been there for a long time, um, and you can't see the changes in Bethlehem, then what happens is you step off a plane and you see the security wall and you hear the people complaining about the tourists not coming and you write another story about Bethlehem, Bethlehem's economic crisis at Christmas time. However, it's not true anymore. 
It's not true, okay? Um, 13 new hotels have been built in Bethlehem in the last five years. They've increased the number of hotel rooms in Bethlehem in the last five years from 1,000 to 5,000. There are three more new hotels which are going to add another 500 rooms uh, to Bethlehem. The number of overnight stays in Bethlehem has doubled in the last five years to 1.8 million a year. Uh, the unemployment rate has dropped by 5%. The number of new businesses that is being started up there has tripled. There are people investing in bowling alleys, in nightclubs, in restaurants, and in other leisure activities. Uh, if, you, if you know Bethlehem and you know what it looks like, you will recognize as you walk down the street that every week there is a new building being built and people are investing in office blocks, in residential buildings, and you go into the car showrooms and you can see that because of the lifting of restrictions on borrowing in the Palestinian banks, people are buying new cars and the economy is moving. It's moving. There's no question about it. So there's no question that since about 2010, the terrible economic crisis in Bethlehem at Christmas time story, it's just not true. It's just not true. But unless you're there and you can actually track those changes and you know what those changes are, if you just parachute in and you look at Bethlehem and you see a place surrounded by a wall and you meet a whole load of people complaining about things, you have nothing to test it against. And you simply don't know. You simply don't know. Um, and... This kind of parachute journalism can happen at, at major events. I, I wrote a book about the death of Yasser Arafat, um, which was, um, which was uh, uh, an interesting book to write because uh, there is a very strong possibility that he was actually murdered. Uh, and if he was actually murdered, what we ask in the book, we ask the question, who? Who actually did it? Um, but at the time that he died, we... we the Palestinians always said that he was murdered, but nobody really took them seriously. Uh, all we knew on the day that he died, which was in November 2004, was that this great, legendary, historic leader of the Palestinian people had, had passed away after this extraordinary life in which he had literally put the Palestinians on the map. The Palest Palestine as a concept, as a nation, hardly existed before Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat took the Palestinians and brought them to the international agenda. He brought them to international attention, and he led them right to the brink of their independent Palestinian state. He's an extraordinary figure, extraordinarily important man. And so that was a, that was a, a very important day, November 2004. He, he had been flown out to a Paris hospital, desperately ill. He died there. And the news came through in the early hours of the morning. And... Um, uh, I thought I, the first thing I should do is I should drive up to Ramallah and go to the Mukatta, the presidential compound, where Yasser Arafat had spent the last few years of his life, some of them actually besieged by Israeli tanks uh, in the period between 2002 and 2003, uh, after the, the suicide bombings and the, and the violence of the Intifada brought that Israeli invasion of the West Bank in 2002. So I, I drive up to the Mukata, hoping to be the first journalist there. Of course, I'm not. There's 200 other reporters there. Uh, they're already waiting. And um, everybody had their, uh, their, their, their stand-up position, their TV stand-up position, lined up on the road next to the, the Mukata, next to the headquarters. And um, you remember that final scene from Blazing Saddles where where they kind of go through the back lot at Universal, and they go through the, the, the saloon, and then the train, and then the space, I can't remember what it was, but like they go through all the different sets. It was a bit like that. I kind of walked up the street, and I did a world tour of the world's news agencies. I went from NBC to ABC to CBS. I walked through CNN, the BBC, Al Jazeera, and kind of back again. And um, I was just coming up to the CNN stand, the CNN position, uh, when it got to about uh, seven or eight o'clock in the morning, it was, it was like the top of the hour, and a convoy of jeeps screeched to a halt and out jumped Christiane Amanpour, uh, who, uh, and, and she, she grabbed the microphone from the local guy. Uh, she'd just come straight from the airport, and uh, she was getting ready to go on live uh, on this historic day. So I thought I'd hang around to see what Christiane Amanpour had to say. She might say something interesting. I might be able to steal it for my story, right? <laughs> Journalism students at the back, you, you got that, right. Okay, so, um, so uh, I, 
Uh, so I hung around, and uh, the first question to Christian Amanpour, so uh, we're now going live from Atlanta to Christian Amanpour. She's in Ramallah. Arafat has just died, and she is outside the Mukatta. So, Christian, can you tell us what exactly is going on in the Mukatta behind you as we speak on this historic morning? And uh, she said, well, I can tell you that in the Mukatta behind me, the presidential compound, there is an emergency meeting of the Palestinian leadership who are now trying to decide what they should do now that their legendary leader has died. And I thought, no, they're not, because I just saw them all leave half an hour ago. Uh, but that was before she arrived, right? So strike one for Christiane Amapur. Uh, and then they said, so Christiane, can you tell us what's going to happen next uh, with the funeral arrangements? I said, well, I can tell you that uh, sources tell us that uh, the uh, body of Yasser Arafat will be flown from Paris to here in Ramallah, where he will be buried this afternoon. Uh, and there'll be the funeral here in Ramallah. And I thought, um, no, they're not, uh, because the Arab leaders who want to be at the funeral have already made it clear that they're not going to come to Ramallah, which is still effectively surrounded by the Israelis. So they're actually going to hold the funeral in Cairo this afternoon, and the burial here in Ramallah won't be till tomorrow. So you got that wrong, too. So that's strike two for Christian Amanpour. And then the third question was, and finally, Christian, can you tell us what are conditions like in the Mukatta behind you, where Arafat spent the last years of his life, some of them besieged by the Israelis. And uh, Ampur said, um, I don't know. I've never been inside the Mukatta. I can't tell you. So that was strike three for Christian Ampur. And I was standing there thinking, what are you doing here? Why? Why have you just parachuted in to tell us nothing or to tell us stuff that I know is inaccurate? What's the point? Why did you push the other guy out of the way? Why not leave the guy who's been here and been here all night and collecting information and knows the situation and, and has been speaking to people, why not let him do the reporting? Parachute journalism. Very, very, not dangerous, but difficult thing when you're trying to actually report the news accurately. But the problem is that we're no longer trying to report the news accurately. Uh, as news competes, on our TV screens and on our, on our computer screens and on our, on our mobile devices uh, against all the other entertainment and advertising that there is, the news has got to look more and more and more like those entertainment programs or you just won't watch it. You're not going to watch the news if it looks boring. And one of, the, one of the strategies that the people who make our news have come up with in order to, to, to keep our attention is to give us something that I call celebrity journalism where they give you a familiar face, someone you trust, someone you know, someone who's a news celebrity, and in the hope that you will listen to them because you know them and you trust them, even though they may know absolutely nothing about the subject that they're supposed to be reporting on. But the, new, you know, but the, 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 the people who create the news, that's their calculation. They think they're going to get more viewers if they keep the face rather than the information accurate. And this leads to terrible problems. One of my friends is, or was, she's dead now, but she was one of Britain's most famous celebrity journalists. And she wrote for a major British newspaper. And um, back in September 2001, she got a call from an editor uh, to say, um, there's just been an attack on the Twin Towers in New York. Get on a plane and fly to New York you are writing tomorrow's lead story in the newspaper. Now, there was only one problem trying to fly to New York on 9-11-2001. If you remember, they weren't allowing any planes to land in New York on that day. They weren't allowing any planes to fly anywhere in American airspace on that day. It was completely closed. You couldn't fly to New York or anywhere else in America from Europe on 9-11. So 10 hours later, she finally gets off a plane in Toronto, which is the closest she can get, to find 14 messages from her editor um, asking where's her story. And so she, she phones her editor back and says, look, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I just got off the plane. I won't be able to do this story for you because I'm in Toronto. I have no idea what's going on in New York. And the, re the reply was, I don't care. I need 3,000 words, and I need them in the next two hours. So she filed them from Toronto. That is celebrity journalism. So you can see that 
what we have here is a clash between the need of reporters and journalists and commentators and analysts to report, the need to get the story accurate and to get it right, and the need also uh, to maintain viewers and maintain interest from the people who are actually going to be consuming that news. And sometimes those things come into uh, real conflict, even when it comes to reporting a story about New York. But just imagine that you're trying to report a story not about New York, not about something where everybody's speaking the same language, a British journalist in America, that's kind of easy. But imagine that you're actually operating in the Middle East, where you're operating in different languages, languages which most of the correspondents don't speak. They don't speak them. Some of the American ones do. Very few of the British ones do. Very few of the European ones do. So just imagine that a Russian-speaking reporter lands in Texas and only speaks Russian and proceeds to analyze and commentate and report on American politics and the, uh, uh, and, and the way that an American society. Just imagine that. That's the situation that we have in the Middle East. We have people flying in who don't speak the language, who don't understand the culture. They don't understand that when you're operating in the Middle East, things are very different. They're very different. The culture is different. The way of speaking to people is different. Those of you who've been to the Jerusalem Center of BYU will know that there is a, a culture in the Middle East of hospitality. It's an extraordinary culture, a warm culture, a welcoming culture. I love it. It means everything takes three times as long. Okay, it's incredibly inefficient. Because anytime I go and interview anybody in the West Bank, first I have to have tea, and then I have to have coffee. Then I really should smoke a cigarette, but I don't smoke, so we get over that. Then I have to have a meal. Then I'm usually introduced to some of their daughters. And then, then we can finally get going on the, on the, on, on the interview. Okay? Everything takes three times as long. And people want to help you. People want to want to give you, you've come all this way. You've bothered to speak to them. They're honored. They're, they're, they're flattered that you come to speak to them. And they want to help you out. They want to help you out. So the basic techniques that we use as journalists that here we expect one thing to happen. When you transplant them to the Middle East, different things happen. And unless you've been there for a while, unless you haven't just parachuted in, unless you understand what's going on, then you may not realize that other things are happening. So here's one of the things we do as journalists, okay? I'm gonna let you into one of the secrets of the trade here. Um, we, have this, we have this little technique um, that we call a question. And here's how it works, okay? I decide, say, to interview you, okay? You have some information that I think might be useful to me. So I ask you a question. You give me an answer. That answer contains information that you know about and that you believe is accurate. I write it down, and I take it away, and I put it in my story. Okay? It's a technical thing. <laughs> Were you listening at the back? You got it, right? Okay. Try that in the Middle East doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, those of you who've been at the Jerusalem Center, do you remember what it's like asking for directions? Yeah? You remember? Okay? You ask for directions in, in, in Israel or in Palestine, okay? People give you directions because you're a visitor. You're asking them. You want some directions. They'll give you some directions. Are they accurate directions? Who knows? Do they know the way to the place that you're trying to go? Who knows? Do they even understand what you're talking about? Because what you think of as the, the, the big tree next to the mosque, they think of as the mosque next to the big trees. They have no idea what you're talking about, right? Do they know? No, but you want some directions? Have some directions. You're a guest, right? That's how it works. That's how it works, and that's how it works in journalism. You ask me a question, could I, could I actually say I don't know? No, I never say I don't know. It's, it's an honor thing. I'm not going to say I don't know. I'm not going to insult you by because that's an insult that what you, you ask me a question not knowing that I don't know about that subject. Of course, I'm not going to embarrass you. So I'll give you an answer. I'll give you an answer. Is it an accurate answer? Who knows? Who knows? Is it based on anything? No idea. No idea. That's how it works. It's a hospitality. It's a very kind thing. It's a hospitality thing. Uh, but it leads to really, really inaccurate journalism.
Really inaccurate journalism. And then there's the sort of, there's like the party lines on things. You've got to understand the party lines on things. If you go and speak to a settler on the West Bank, an Israeli settler on the West Bank, it's very difficult on first meeting to get any settler on the West Bank to say anything other than this land was given to us by God and we will stay here and this is ours and we will never compromise with anybody and we're here to stay. Because that's the party line. That's the party line. You need to get to know them and you need to understand them and you need to write, ask the right questions in order to get to those people who actually don't believe that this land was given to them by God, who are prepared to compromise who won't stay if there could be a chance of peace. And that's a large proportion of the settlers in the West Bank. But try seeing how many of those settlers are actually quoted in, 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 in English language newspaper reports. Because the English language newspaper reports are all written by parachute journalists who've only ever met one settler in their life. Same with the Palestinians. Same with the Palestinians. The party line is that the Palestinians, we are all united together against the Israeli occupation. That's the party line. So I meet a Palestinian in the street, or I meet them for the first time, that's what they're going to tell me. So I'm sitting there interviewing a prominent Christian leader in Bethlehem, and I'm, and I'm saying, tell me, are there any problems between the Christians and the Muslims? And he's saying, no, we're brothers, we are united against the Israeli occupation, there is no daylight between the Christians and the Muslims. Meanwhile, his wife is sitting on the other side of the room talking to my Arabic driver, saying, I'm so embarrassed. I don't want you to believe for one second that what my husband is telling the foreigner is true. Of course we hate the Muslims. They've been uh, chasing my daughters. They've stolen our land. We're sending our daughters away uh, to be educated, and we're probably going to leave ourselves in a few years. Different sides of the room. Same family, completely different answer. But unless you know what's going on, unless you know the Middle East, unless you understand the culture, then you really don't have a hope. And uh, this was brought home to me very, very boldly uh, soon after I first arrived. And um, I w I'll finish with this, and then if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. Um, soon after I arrived, there was uh, the, uh, the, the second intifada broke out in uh, the autumn of 2000. It broke out basically on the 30th of September, 2000. And it then deteriorated into the most savage violence from both sides. There were suicide bombings, there were shootings of Palestinian children, there were uh, bombings uh, and, and aerial assassinations by the Israelis against Palestinians, there were Palestinian bomb attacks against cafes and buses and, and all sorts. It was a brutal, brutal time. But none of that really deteriorated that badly until about December. Before December, it was actually pretty mild. The worst that we had was uh, there was some shooting from Bet Jala down in uh, to south of Jerusalem across to Gilo, um, which is across the tunnel road. If those of you who've been there remember where that was, um, across the valley. And there had been a shooting, and a couple of people, a couple of Israelis had been hurt, and the Israelis had shot back. And that was about it. It wasn't too bad yet. So three weeks in, the... Uh, there was a, a summit held at Sharm el-Sheikh, and I call it the Forgotten Summit, because if you look back over all the stuff that's been written about the Intifada and the histories, you'll find hardly anybody mentions this summit. Uh, but Clinton came over, and uh, Colin, was it Colin? No, it wasn't Colin Powell. Who would have been the Secretary of State? Albright, I think it was at the time, yeah? Albright came over, yeah? Albright came over. King Abdullah was there, President Mubarak was there, Yasser Arafat was there, Ehud Barak, who was then the Israeli Prime Minister, was there. Like, this was the big deal. And this was three weeks after the beginning of the Intifada in October 2000. And we assumed that what we'd seen was basically the Palestinian battle for independence. They'd said they were going to declare a state anyway in September 2000. The Camp David peace talks had collapsed. And anyway, the Palestinian state couldn't really be brought into, into being by as a sort of a gift of the Israelis and the Americans at Camp David. They had to fight for it. It was a struggle that had gone on for decades, and there had to be a war that brought it into existence. We kind of understood that. We all assumed it was a piece of theater. And so three weeks in, there's the summit, and they agree that um, they're going to retreat back to the ceasefire lines before the Intifada began three weeks earlier, and they're going to return to the negotiating table, and then there's going to be a peace treaty, and then there's going to be a deal, and we'll see a Palestinian state, Israeli state, side by side. 
That's what we assumed was going to happen. And so I thought what would be nice would be uh, because they were, they were planning that Yasser Arafat would go on television at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Arabic. And Ehud Barak would go on television at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Hebrew, speaking to their own communities, reading the same statement in their own languages uh, that would end this little spat that had erupted three weeks earlier. So it was, kind of, it was kind of a cool thing. I thought, let's go and sit with one of those families in Bet Jala, one of those Palestinian families who've had the shooting going on over their heads, and let's sit with them as they celebrate the outbreak of peace, and now they can walk the streets at night, and now there's no more shooting, and, and, and that'll be a nice thing to do. And so I said to my you know, Arabic uh, translator, I said to my colleague, um, you know, let's, let's go. He said, well, you can go, but I'm not going. I said, why not? He said, because it's not going to happen. I said, what do you mean it's not going to happen? There's no way, he said, that Arafat will make that speech. I drew myself up to my full British height of education and uh, international experience. My dear fellow, I said, you don't understand how international diplomacy works. If the President of the United States and the Secretary of State and the President of Egypt and the King of Jordan and the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of the Palestinian Authority are all coming to Sharm el-Sheikh, it, that's the theater, it's already been worked out. This is already scripted in advance. There's no way they can all come there and fail. It just can't happen. You, you can't humiliate the President of the United States like that. You just can't do it. You don't understand. He said, okay, I'll come. So we get there about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We interview the family. We, 5 o'clock rolls around. Nothing happens. 6 o'clock rolls around. Nothing happens. 7 o'clock approaches. Uh, he says to me, look, this is getting a bit embarrassing. They'd like to have dinner. And if you don't mind, it's going to get dark soon. And I'd like to leave before the shooting starts. <laughs> so we left. And we're driving back to Jerusalem. And I turned to him. I said, what, what happened there? What, what just happened? He said, Matthew... Welcome to the Middle East. You are not in London now. The normal rules that you think you know do not apply in this part of the world. And that was a crucial lesson that I learned in my reporting. And I think it's a crucial lesson that every reporter in the Middle East needs to learn. Thank you.